Thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I am thrilled today to get a chance to talk about something I'm passionate about. And that is the human services. And what I want to try to do today is to reverse some conventional wisdom that a lot of us hear about the nature of the human services. And that conventional wisdom is often conveyed in a chart like this. And this chart sort of talks about, or at least it tells a story, right? The chart tells a story about the rise of healthcare costs here as a percentage of GDP. And a lot of economists tend to call this a cost disease. What they mean by that is that they divide the economy into what they call productive and stagnant sectors. The hallmark of a productive sector is that it gradually reduces its share of GDP. So you can think about agriculture or manufacturing. In the 1920s, agriculture was a huge part of the economy. It's gradually shrunk to about 3%. Manufacturing has done the same thing. And a lot of economists, when they look at a chart like this, they say, if we have ever-increasing healthcare costs, they'll be parasitic on our economy. They'll drag our economy down. They might even impede our ability to compete on the global stage. And by the way, this cost disease narrative has been around for a long time. Even in the 1980s, early 1980s, when healthcare was just about 8% of the economy, you can find articles, I've done some historical research here, where people are panicking. They're saying the economy is going to collapse due to this 8% of GDP growth, you know, or 8% of GDP share of, the econ of healthcare. And that has just continued over time. Now, why is this a problem? The problem here is because what it leads to is a substitutive approach versus a complementary approach for technology. Okay? The substitutive approach that is really a part of the cost disease narrative goes like this. It says that if manufacturing is so productive, the way we make human services like healthcare more productive is to make the workers within those sectors more like machines, right? We have interchangeable parts, that we can bring in the logic of the assembly line to healthcare. And also, that's been supercharged recently by talk about artificial intelligence and robotics. And we see this in particular in a recent application of AI to stopping suicidality, okay? There was an application developed by an NGO in England that was designed to watch people's Twitter feeds, and it would report to individuals if anyone they knew that they followed on Twitter seemed suicidal from their tweets. Okay? And it would send a little message saying, watch out, your friend seems really down. Now, immediately after this was implemented, people were upset about it. Sarcasm was taken as an indicator of suicidality. People who got the messages said, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to deal with this particular problem. And it even raised privacy concerns under the European General Data Protection Regulation and was shut down. I contrast that with a better inter intervention called Project Durkheim. In Project Durkheim, there were major differences. They focused on veterans and people with particular uh, um, uh, epidemiological uh, potentiality for suicidality. They emphasized opt-in. They said, we've got to have people opt-in. And they said, when we use AI-driven natural language processing, looking at people's social media posts, we are going to send the knowledge to their friends. We're going to inform people who are licensed healthcare professionals. Okay? It so far has been a much better intervention. And what it exemplifies is a complementary approach where technology complements human services professionals rather than replaces them. The same thing, by the way, the same logic applies to many forms of social robotics. Now, here we have an example of a Japanese developed social robot called the Paro. This is a stuffed animal, a little seal, and what it does is that if you pet it, it starts to mule. It'll bat its eyes at you. It might make some noises that are somewhat sad if you move away from it for too long. And it has been used in many nursing homes and other facilities to entertain elders, especially those with dementia. Now, you could take the paro and say, wow, we've now found a way to really cut our costs in terms of caregiving. Whatever time was spent talking with people, just give them a paro, right? That would be the wrong approach. And fortunately, this isn't just my intuition. 
There have actually been very interesting studies done that say that if you introduce the PARO in an environment where you have individuals that are licensed healthcare professionals that know how to generate dialogue about it, how to get people excited about it, how to get people talking about it, that leads to a much better outcome for the elders to which it's exposed than just giving them the technology, giving them the robot. Now, of course, the counter to everything I've just said is we don't have the money, we don't have the funds to invest. And you know, we heard a similar story back in the 1930s. Okay? In the 1930s, the economy was in much, much tougher straits than it is today. And even there was a, ta there was a Great Depression at the time. But what the government did in response to those economic straits was it did not sort of disinvest, it didn't say we've got to go into austerity mode. It actually invested in people, it invested in health, well-being, work that was done by entities like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration, etc. And I think one of our missed opportunities over the past couple of decades was that the Affordable Care Act, it's right there in the name, it's all about affordability. But where's the Quality Care Act? Where is the act that's trying to make sure that these incredible advances in AI and data that we have on the horizon can complement existing professionals and that they're fairly paid as they're keeping track of new data, as they're taking on new roles, as they're learning things about computer science and other aspects of the new healthcare system? How do we sort of develop that attitude toward healthcare among our policymakers versus the austerity narrative? I think it is possible. You know, I think if we think about the ways in which the inspiring examples of investment in human beings, in our environment, in our infrastructure happened in the past, it's possible for us to do this again. But in order to get there, we have to tell a different story about healthcare. We have to stop buying into the austerity narrative that healthcare is taking up too much of the economy, that it's a parasite, that it's dragging us down. What we instead have to do is we have to think about human services as the backbone of the economy, as something that's inspiring, as something that's as inspiring as, say, the moon, uh, a moonshot, the literal moonshot. Well, now we have the precision medicine moonshot, right? We have to think about metaphors that exemplify the value of our health infrastructure and our health personnel. And I'll close today just by thinking about you know, different periods in historical time and when we did this. In the 1930s, we did have a really great investment in human labor and in trying to ensure that technology complemented rather than replaced human labor. Similarly, in the 1960s, we had great expansions in Social Security, for example, with disability insurance and other initiatives. And I think now is the time to really renew that. And we even heard it from uh, President Obama himself, Obama himself when he described the Affordable Care Act. He didn't say this is the final word in health policy. He said this is like a starter home. We're going to build on it. And I think of it more as like a foundation, right? I think this is a foundation for great advances that we can make in healthcare. But to make those advances, we have to look back on some inspiring economists of the past. And I think particularly the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes is famous for this idea of the paradox of thrift. And the idea was there was, he was writing in the 1930s, and he observed that a lot of people were so desperate and worried about the decline in the economy that they started saving more and more money. They just wanted to hoard money to themselves just in case things got worse in the future. But the problem there was that, say, you, know, you have someone that's a hairdresser that decides, I'm not going to take taxis anymore. Well, that person may find out that, yes, they've saved some money on taxis, but then if all hairdressers in the economy decide to do the same thing, then taxi drivers have no money to get their hair done, right? <laughs> or similar types of problems occur. What one person is saving ends up taking away income from others. And Keynes, by identifying that, said, you can reverse this narrative of the paradox of thrift by saying, if we emphasize the ability of individuals to consume, that can create a virtuous cycle of consumption. So this brings us back to the original problem of the talk, the cost disease. My bottom line here is that rather than seeing the cost of various human services as a disease on the economy, we instead can see it as a cure to the problem of mass joblessness and all, via automation, right? We hear the robots are taking all the jobs. We hear all these narratives about people being knocked out of positions and work. I think the answer to that has to be trying to create and invest in sectors that can employ and indeed are doing caring work, important work that's often neglected. 
And I'll close by saying that we can invest in human expertise rather than simply replacing it. That's within our ability. We can have that as our goal. But the key is seeing human services as a boon to the economy, as a cure to the potential problem of mass joblessness, rather than as something that's dragging the economy down. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope we can all work together to work on this cost cure and this investment in human expertise. Thank you. Thank you.